Leviathan, or the matter, for me and power of a commonwealth, ecclesiastical and civil. Book by Thomas Hobbes. Narrated by Andrew. Originally published in 1651. This is a great audiobook production, created for research, study, and discussion purposes. Chapter 10. Of Power, Worth, Dignity, Honor, and Worthiness. Power. The power of a man, to take it universally, is his present means to obtain some future apparent good, and is either origin all or instrument all. Natural power is the eminence of the faculties of body or mind as extraordinary strength for me, prudence, arts, eloquence, liberality, nobility. Instrument all are those powers which acquired by these or by fortune are means and instruments to acquire more. As riches, reputation, friends, and the secret working of God, which men call good luck. For the nature of power is in this point, like to fame, increasing as it proceeds, or like the motion of heavy bodies, which the further they go, make still the more hast. The greatest of humane powers is that which is compounded of the powers of most men, united by consent, in one person, natural, or civil, that has the use of all their powers depending on his will, such as is the power of a commonwealth, or depending on the wills of each particular, such as is the power of a faction, or of divers factions leagued. Therefore to have servants is power, to have friends is power, for they are strengths united. Also riches joined with liberality is power, because it procureth friends and servants, without liberality, not so, because in this case they defend not, but expose men to envy as a prey. Reputation of power is power, because it draweth with it the adherence of those that need protection. So is reputation of love of a man's country, called popularity, for the same reason. Also, what quality soever mocketh a man beloved, or feared of many, or the reputation of such quality, is power, because it is a means to have the assistance and service of many. Good success is power, because it mocketh reputation of wisdom, or good fortune, which makes men either fear him, or rely on him. Affability of men already in power is increase of power, because it gaineth love. Reputation of prudence in the conduct of peace or war is power, because to prudent men we commit the government of ourselves more willingly than to others. Nobility is power, not in all places, but only in those commonwealths, where it has privileges, for in such privileges consisteth their power. Eloquence is power, because it is seeming prudence. For me is power, because being a promise of good, it recommendeth men to the favor of women and strangers. The sciences are small power, because not eminent, and therefore not acknowledged in any man, nor are at all, but in a few, and in them, but of a few things. For science is of that nature, as none can understand it to be, but such as in a good measure have attained it. Arts of public use, as fortification, making of engines, and other instruments of war, because they conferate a defense and victory, are power. And though the true mother of them be science, namely the mathematics, yet, because they are brought into the light, by the hand of the artificer, they be esteemed the midwife passing with the vulgar for the mother, as his issue. Worth. The value, or worth of a man, is as of all other things, his price, that is to say, so much as would be given for the use of his power, and therefore is not absolute, but a thing dependent on the need and judgment of another. An able conductor of soldiers is of great price in time of war present or imminent, but in peace not so. A learned and uncorrupt judge is much worth in time of peace, but not so much in war. And as in other things, so in men, not the seller, but the buyer determines the price. For let a man, as most men do, rate themselves as the highest value they can. Yet their true value is no more than it is esteemed by others. The manifestation of the value we set on one another is that which is commonly called honoring and dishonoring. To value a man at a high rate is to honor him, at a low rate is to dishonor him. But high and low, in this case, is to be understood by comparison to the rate that each man setteth on himself. Dignity. The public worth of a man, which is the value set on him by the commonwealth, is that which men commonly call dignity. And this value of him by the commonwealth is understood by offices of command, judicature, public employment, or by names and titles, 
introduce for distinction of such value, to honor and dishonor. To pray to another for aid of any kind is to honor, because a signal we have an opinion he has power to help, and the more difficult the aid is, the more is the honor. To obey is to honor, because no man obeys them, whom they think have no power to help or hurt them. And consequently to disobey is to dishonor. To give great gifts to a man is to honor him, because tis buying of protection and acknowledging of power. To give little gifts is to dishonor, because it is but almas and signifies an opinion of the need of small helps. To be sedulous in promoting another's good, also to flatter, is to honor, as a signal we seek his protection or aid. To neglect is to dishonor. To give way or place to another in any commodity is to honor, being a confession of greater power. To arrogate is to dishonor. To shew any signal of love or fear of another is to honor, for both to love and to fear is to value. To contemn or less to love or fear than he expects is to dishonor, for tis undervaluing. To praise, magnify, or call happy is to honor, because nothing but goodness, power, and felicity is valued. To revile, mock, or pity is to dishonor. To speak to another with consideration, to appear before him with decency and humility is to honor him, as signas of fear to offend. To speak to him rashly, to do anything before him obscenely, slovenly, impudently, is to dishonor. To believe, to trust, to rely on another, is to honor him, signa of opinion of his virtue and power. To distrust, or not believe, is to dishonor. To hearken to a man's counsel, or discourse of what kind soever, is to honor, as a signa we think him wise, or eloquent, or witty. To sleep, or go forth, or talk the while, is to dishonor. To do those things to another, which he takes for signas of honor, or which the law or custom makes so, is to honor. Because in approving the honor done by others, he acknowledgeth the power which others acknowledge. To refuse to do them, is to dishonor. To agree with an opinion, is to honor, as being a signa of approving his judgment and wisdom. To dissent, is dishonor, and an upbraiding of error, and, if the dissent be in many things, a folly. To imitate, is to honor, for it is vehemently to approve. To imitate one's enemy is to dishonor. To honor those another honors is to honor him as a signa of approbation of his judgment. To honor his enemies is to dishonor him. To employ in counsel or in actions of difficulty is to honor as a signa of opinion of his wisdom or other power. To deny employment in the same cases to those that seek it is to dishonor. All these ways of honoring are natural and as well within, as without commonwealths. But in commonwealths, where he, or they that have the supreme authority, can make whatsoever they please, to stand for signas of honor, there be other honors. A sovereign doth honor a subject, with whatsoever title, or office, or employment, or action, that he himself will have taken for a signa of his will to honor him. The king of Persia honored Mordecai, when he appointed he should be conducted through the streets in the king's garment upon one of the king's horses, with a crown on his head. And a prince before him, proclaiming, Thus shall it be done to him that the king will honor. And yet another king of Persia, or the same another time, to one that demanded for some great service. To wear one of the king's robes, gave him leave so to do, but with his addition, that he should wear it as the king's full, and then it was dishonor. So that of civil honor, such as her magistracy, offices, titles. And in some places coats and scutcheons painted, and men honor such as have them, as having so many signas of favor in the commonwealth, which favor is power. Honorable is whatsoever possession, action, or quality, is an argument and signa of power. And therefore to be honored, loved, or feared of many, is honorable, as arguments of power. To be honored of few or none, dishonorable. Good fortune, if lasting, honorable, as a signa of the favor of God. Ill fortune and losses, dishonorable. Riches are honorable, for they are power. Poverty, dishonorable. Magnanimity, liberality, hope, courage, confidence are honorable, for they proceed from the conscience of power. Pusillanimity, parsimony, fear, diffidence are dishonorable. Timely resolution or determination of what a man is to do is honorable, as being the contempt of small difficulties and dangers. 
and irresolution, dishonorable. As a signa of too much valuing of little impediments and little advantages, for when a man has weighed things as long as the time permits and resolves not, the difference of weight is but little. And therefore if he resolve not, he overvalues little things, which is pusillanimity. All actions and speeches that proceed or seem to proceed from much experience, science, discretion, or wit are honorable, for all these are powers. Actions or words that proceed from error, ignorance, or folly, dishonorable. Gravity, as far a forth as it seems to proceed from a mind employed on something else, is honorable, because employment is a signa of power. But if it seem to proceed from a purpose to appear grave, it is dishonorable. For the gravity of the former is like the steadiness of a ship laden with merchandise, but of the later, like the steadiness of a ship ballasted with sand and other trash. To be conspicuous, that is to say, to be known, for wealth, office, great actions, or any imminent good, is honorable, as a signa of the power for which he is conspicuous. On the contrary, obscurity is dishonorable. To be descended from conspicuous parents is honorable, because they the more easily attain the aids and friends of their ancestors. On the contrary, to be descended from obscure parentage is dishonorable. Actions proceeding from equity, joined with loss, are honorable, as signas of magnanimity, for magnanimity is a signa of power. On the contrary, craft, shifting, neglect of equity, is dishonorable. Nor does it alter the case of honor, whether in action, so it be great and difficult, and consequently a signa of much power, be just or unjust. For honor consisteth only in the opinion of power. Therefore the ancient heathen did not think they dishonored, but greatly honored the gods, when they introduced them in their poems, committing rapes, thefts, and other great, but unjust, or unclean acts, in so much as nothing is so much celebrated in Jupiter as his adulteries, nor in Mercury as his frauds and thefts, of whose praises in a hymn of Homer, the greatest is this, that being born in the morning, he had invented music at noon, and before night, stolen away the cattle of Apollo from his herdsmen. Also amongst men, till there were constituted great commonwealths, it was thought no dishonor to be a pirate, or a highway theft, but rather a lawful trade, not only amongst the Greeks, but also amongst all other nations, as is manifest by the histories of Antine time. And at this day, in this part of the world, private duels are, and always will be honorable, though unlawful, till such time as there shall be honor ordained for them that refuse, and ignominy for them that make the challenge. For duels also are many times effects of courage, and the ground of courage is always strength or skill, which are power. Though for the most part they be effects of rash speaking, and of the fear of dishonor, in one, or both the combatants, who engage by rashness, are driven into the list to avoid disgrace. Scutcheons and coats of arms hereditary, where they have any imminent privileges, are honorable. Otherwise not, for their power consisteth either in such privileges, or in riches, or some such thing as is equally honored in other men. This kind of honor, commonly called gentry, has been derived from the Antine Germans. For there never was any such thing known, where the German customs were unknown. Nor is it now anywhere in use, where the Germans have not inhabited. The Antine Greek commanders, when they went to war, had their shields painted with such devices as they pleased. Insomuch as an unpainted buckler was a signa of poverty, and of a common soldier, but they transmitted not the inheritance of them. The Romans transmitted the marks of their families, but they were the images, not the devises of their ancestors. Amongst the people of Asia, Africa, and America, there is not, nor was ever, any such thing. The Germans only had that custom, from whom it has been derived into England, France, Spain, and Italy, when in great numbers they either aid the Romans, or made their own conquests in these western parts of the world. For Germany, being anniently, as all other countries, in their beginnings, divided amongst an infinite number of little lords, or masters of families, that continually had wars one with another. Those masters, or lords, principally to the end they might, when they were covered with arms, be known by their followers. And partly for ornament, both painted their armor, or their scutcheon, or coat, with the picture of some beast, or other thing. And also put some imminent and visible mark upon the crest of their helmets. 
and his ornament both of the arms and crest, descended by inheritance to their children. To the eldest pure, and to the rest with some note of diversity, such as the old master, that is to say in Dutch, the Heralt thought fit. But when many such families, joined together, made a greater monarchy, this duty of the Heralt, to distinguish scutcheons, was made a private office apart. And the issue of these lords is the great and antient gentry, which for the most part bear living creatures, noted for courage and rapine. Or castles, battlements, belts, weapons, bars, palisados, and other notes of war, nothing being then in honor, but virtue military. Afterwards, not only kings, but popular commonwealths, gave diverse manners of scutcheons, to such as went forth to the war, or returned from it, for encouragement, or recompense to their service. All which, by an observing reader, may be found in such ancient histories, Greek and Latine, as make mention of the German nation, and manners, in their times. Titles of Honor Titles of Honor, such as are Duke, Count, Marquis, and Baron, are honorable. As signifying the value set upon them by the sovereign power of the commonwealth. Which titles, were in old time titles of office, and command, derived some from the Romans, some from the Germans, and French. Dukes, in Latine duces, being generals in war, counts, comites, such as bear the general company out of friendship. And were left to govern and defend places conquered, and pacified. Marquises, Marchiones, were counts that governed the marches, or bounds of the empire. Which titles of Duke, Count, and Marquis came into the empire, about the time of Constantine the Great, from the customs of the German militia. But Baron, seems to have been a title of the Gauls, and signifies a great man, such as were the kings, or princes men, whom they employed in war about their persons. And seems to be derived from Vir, to Br, and Bar, that signified the same in the language of the Gauls, that Vir in Latine. And thence to Baro, and Baro, so that such men were called Barons, and after Barones, and, in Spanish, Verones. But he that would know more particularly the origin all of titles of honor, may find it, as I have done this, in Mr. Selden's most excellent treatise of that subject. In process of time these offices of honor, by occasion of trouble, and for reasons of good and peaceable government, were turned into mere titles. Serving for the most part, to distinguish the precedence, place, and order of subjects in the commonwealth. And men were made dukes, counts, marquises, and barons of places, wherein they had neither possession, nor command, and other titles also, were devised to the same end. Worthiness fitness. Worthiness is a thing different from the worth, or value of a man, and also from his merit, or desert. And consisteth in a particular power, or ability for that whereof he is said to be worthy, which particular ability is usually named fitness or aptitude. For he is worthiest to be a commander, to be a judge, or to have any other charge that is best fitted with the qualities required to the well-discharging of it. And worthiest of riches that has the qualities most requisite for the well-using of them. Any of which qualities being absent, one may nevertheless be a worthy man and valuable for something else. Again, a man may be worthy of riches, office, and employment, that nevertheless, can plead no right to have it before another, and therefore cannot be said to merit or deserve it. For merit, presupposeth a right, and that the thing deserved is due by promise, of which I shall say more hereafter, when I shall speak of contracts. For more audiobook like this, hit the subscribe button, and click on the notification bell so you get notified when we post a new audiobook. Thanks for listening.